in the back line there. Yeah? We have to forgive the voice. I've had a bit of a cold the last uh, week or so, so uh, just uh, shout if I need to speak up. Um, yeah, welcome. I know you, most of you have been here uh, a while already. I hope you've been enjoying yourselves. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, open source handhelds, um, which in itself is a bit of a misnomer, really. I mean, the handheld itself generally isn't open source, but we're talking about handhelds on which you could run open source software. Um, yeah, so what we're not talking about is uh, developing on, for example, uh, Sony PSP or Nintendo DS. Yeah, you can go on, a, go on the internet and download a, an SDK for that and a tool chain. Go ahead, make some nice games, but it's not really designed for yeah, open source use. What we're looking at today is uh, devices that are designed with that in mind. So they're actually released and at the same time you get a tool chain for it and they say, oh, here's how it works. Go and make some nice games for us. A um, bit about me. I'm, uh, yeah, I have quite a collection of uh, old computers and consoles and games. Uh, yeah, much to my uh, girlfriend's disappointment. Um, now, I use a lot of open source software, both in my work and at home as well. Um, I like to contribute as much as I can. Uh, yeah, time limitations are uh, always present. Um, I ported some stuff to the Pandora, which we'll be looking at shortly. That's uh, one of the handhelds. Um, the, the mostly emulators, so uh, MAME, uh, for example, emulator for the, the Sega Master System, some other stuff. Uh, I'm also a Unix engineer at uh, Competa, which is an uh, IC, uh, ICT uh, solution provider in, uh, in the ICE rack. Um, so we'll have a quick look at the history, which uh, yeah, isn't particularly long, uh, I have to say. Uh, the history of these devices. Um, the ARM platform, which as we'll see in a moment is, uh, is an important factor in most of these devices. Uh, operating systems, which, uh, yeah, which run on the devices. On top of that, of course, uh, you're going to have some, some software, some uh, applications, some games, stuff like that. Uh, Quick look at how you can get involved in development. And uh, yeah, although we can't really uh, see it yet, a quick look at what might uh, be coming in the future. Um, yeah, as is traditional, or time at the end for questions if you have them, please. If you have any, uh, just shoot away. So the history. Uh, we're not quite going this far back, don't worry. Um, we're going back about 10 years to 2001. Um, and this is the machine that sort of started the, the open handheld uh, scene. Um, yeah, it's called the, the GP32, made by a Korean company called Game Park. Uh, it came out around about the same time as the uh, <coughs> Nintendo's uh, uh, Game Boy Advance. So it has similar specs. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look a lot these days. Uh, when you look at it, you know, 8 megs of RAM, yeah. What can you do with that? And a, a three and a half inch screen, which is uh, plenty big, but 320, 240, yeah. Well, it turns out this is plenty specs for uh, most games, running old arca arcade games, never went above 220 something lines anyway. Um, but the, the thing that made this different from the, from the Game Boy and other commercial handhelds was that you could use uh, smart media storage instead of a cartridge. So you could write your own software, you could package it up, put it on this uh, memory uh, stick, shove it in, and you could play the games. So this went pretty well. Um, the next console that came out was the, uh, yeah, the GP2X. Quite an upgrade from the other one, and yeah, it's made by GPH, which is not the same as Game Park. It's actually a few guys from Game Park weren't really happy with uh, how things are going, so they went off, started their own company. And this is what they came up with. It's uh, well, it's much more advanced. Yeah, dual core. Yeah, it's not not too identical core, so it's not a got to uh, SMP or anything on it. But uh, you could use uh, the second core for, uh, you know, and then maybe like they had in old arcade machines, you'd have a processor for the game and one for sound, for example. So there's not a lot of things that use it, but it's a nice little feature. A lot more memory, 64 megs. Yeah, again, doesn't sound like enough uh, these days, but you can do a hell of a lot with it. Uh, and the recurring theme of the 320 by uh, 240 screen. Um, 
nice feature this one had the SD storage instead of the uh, the old smart media things so yeah a lot more space and uh, yeah a little bit easier to come by uh, these days anyway um, yeah this uh, this is the Dingu A320 it's uh, a little bit of an oddball as it uses a, a MIPS processor I don't think we've heard from this company since the Chinese company but they uh, yeah, th they brought this out, and you could develop games for it. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's kind of a niche thing now, uh, even in the uh, a niche inside a niche, uh, if you will. Um, but it's a nice little thing. If you can combine them with some with some great uh, emulators and stuff uh, for them, uh, mini SD storage. Yeah, you can see it's you can see it with the size of the uh, the earphones. That is really a a tiny device. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. Uh, the GPH came out with a second handheld. Uh, as you can see, yeah, it's a major upgrade from, uh, from before, over 500 megahertz uh, ARM9 processor. Uh, the first one to have built-in 3D acceleration in the hardware. Uh, same memory as the GP32 uh, or uh, GP2X, um, but a really nice, uh, uh, really nice screen. It's uh, yeah, an AMOLED. Uh, Technology. Unfortunately, some of the earlier ones uh, you know, seem to be getting a bit of pixel rot uh, around this time. But uh, if you've got a good one, it's a really nice screen to look at. Uh, SD and SEAC, so much more storage again. But yeah, all this is good. I mean, most of the things we've seen just now, it comes from one company or yeah, a company that came from that company. Um, but there are a bunch of guys uh, hanging around on the internet forums uh, for these handheld things. I said, yeah, I, I really like these uh, GPH handhelds, but there's always something wrong with them that I don't like. So there's a bunch of guys that got together and started working on a new handheld, which eventually became the Pandora. Um, big upgrade again. Well, reasonably large uh, compared to the, uh, to the Wiz before. Um, yeah. Much, uh, much more memory, for example, faster processor, more hardware on there, um, bigger screen, greater resolution, more storage. Uh, it's the first that came with built-in uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And yeah, the price to match is 330 euros. Is, uh, was the original price. I'm not sure what it, where it's at now um, because there's uh, problems with the availability. That's why uh, you know, there's a, a bit of an in-joke uh, here that the the thing came out. Uh, it will always be coming out in two months. So it's a uh, yeah. Well, when, when's the Pandora coming? Yeah, two months. And then two months later, yeah, two months. And it kept going on. And uh, yeah, they have shipped quite a lot. They're still shipping the first batch. That's more than a year later. So there are supply problems. But uh, I believe if you have uh, five hundred dollars, you can uh, you can skip the queue and get one quite quickly. Hot on the heels. Uh, GPH came with uh, a Kanu. Um, yeah, it's a sort of similar specs to the to the Wiz, but more memory. Um, yeah, it's a, just a, a different package. You get the analog stick. Some people aren't very uh, happy with. More uh, more used to uh, to a D-pad usually, uh, but it works pretty well in my opinion. Um, stuff like the accelerometer. Yeah, but otherwise. Very similar. Yeah, you can do Wi-Fi. You need a USB attachment, but a lot cheaper than the uh, than the Pandora, and you can get one a lot more easily. So that's uh, the kind of devices we're we're looking at. This is the uh, a short introduction to the ARM architecture. As you saw, most of the handhelds uh, use that. Um, this is actually a picture of the the headquarters of uh, ARM Holdings. Uh, so where did these ARM uh, processors come from? Uh, look back to uh, well, even further in 1981. And uh, if any of you happened to be uh, at a, a UK a primary school around that time, you you definitely know what this is. Anyone uh, anyone recognize it? Yeah, the yeah? It certainly is. And then at the uh, yeah 6502 processor, same thing as uh, you know Commodore 64. Uh, the PC Engine games console uh, use that 
So this is what BBC or uh, Acorn, uh, sorry, were, were busy with at, around that time. But yeah, things were moving forward. The IBM PC was coming out. Uh, people wanted to get into a, yeah, a, a bit more advanced computing. New applications have been thought of. So yeah, Acorn wanted to, to build a PC as well. But they figured, well, the, the 6502, it's not going to do it on its own. We need to, we need to supplement it with something. Or we, need to in, we need to do something different, build up the specs so we can uh, do like proper GUI uh, applications, stuff like that. Um, when well, they looked around, they looked at all kinds of different processes and uh, possibilities and figured, well, actually, the best thing we can do is just think of our own. We'll just start to design our own architecture. And we're not going to be limited by any of these uh, other manufacturers. Um, and at the time, uh, Berkeley, uh, yeah, the well-known university where BSD comes from, and uh, a lot of LSD, uh, depending who you talk to, um, they were busy with the uh, with a risk uh, risk project. We were still in the uh, early days, but the guys from Acon they went they went along there and had a look at it, and uh, yeah, not long uh, later. They developed the first, uh, the first of the ARM uh, processors, you know, the ARM 1, 2 uh, came out very quickly after. Um, you know, it was going so well, but by 1990 they, they spun off into their own company, Advanced Risk Machines, of course where, the, where ARM comes from. Another change in name in 1998, was a, apparently that had to do with, uh, with the company floating on the stock exchange. It didn't really come over very well to investors to have the, the name Risk in your company's name. So they uh, just went with the, uh, with the acronym. Uh, 2005, there's already 1.6 billion of these uh, things uh, licensed. Yeah, in licenses, is a, you know, the, the point here, you can't actually go to ARM and say, right, then, then give me a few thousand processes or so, you, know, you need to get them somewhere else. We just design them. A couple of years ago, 2008, there's already 10 billion of these things floating around. Now this year, anyone like to hazard a guess how many there are out in the wild? 15 billion, considering there's about 7 billion of us uh, walking around, that's quite a lot. So what are they uh, used in? Well, everything. Your yeah, mobile phones, definitely. <laughs> 98% of all mobile phones, and that's all mo uh, mobile phones ever, not just now, uh, have an ARM processor inside them. MP3 players, uh, iPod, for example, uh, routers, nice uh, little uh, lightweight network devices, uh, hard drives. You look on the bottom, there's a little uh, printed circuit board. Yep, often there's an ARM processor on there for uh, doing, uh, uh, yeah, converting between interfaces and DMA stuff like that. And of course, handheld consoles. So, why why use this in a in a, in a handheld console? Well, not really a reason in itself, but it, it's it's a risk CPU, um, which means it's a relatively simple design compared to Intel or whatever. And that means, yeah, you need less transistors and you need less power, and uh, that means. If you've got a battery operated devices, you know, then it's going to last a lot longer and you're not going to be bothered with uh, heat output. You're not going to need any huge uh, heat sinks on your chips or anything. So you can have nice little compact packages, uh, ideal. You get a nice powerful platform in a small device and that means we can have great fun with it. And if you zoom in on the, the middle things here, how do you make these, uh, these small devices uh, so powerful? Well, one of the popular approaches is the uh, system on chip or SOC. And if you're familiar with microcontrollers, you know, you, you know the idea. Put everything you have into one little package. Uh, so you've got the, you know, your CPU core you know, or cores in there, a uh, bit of flash memory for storage, a bit of uh, you know, interfaces uh, to the outside world, stuff like that. Um, but what about the, uh, the RAM, your memory? That's the one thing we're missing in that picture. And you've got two options, really. You can, you can stick it on the, the chip itself. I believe this kind of uniform-looking area, it's a, some memory. This is a, you know, some kind of big microprocessor. It's not, a, it's not an ARM, but you get the idea. 
Uh, but what we're seeing now is that it's more uh, you're using a, a package on package uh, technology, which means you can basically stick two chips together. So you can make one chip, it's got the processor on and all the interface stuff, and you can uh, solder on another chip with memory or other stuff. So it means manufacturers just have to make one base unit and they can design other stuff to plug into it. And it's still only you know, a few millimeters thick even when it's all soldered together. Um, one other thing is this comes up a lot uh, on, on the, the handheld scene, uh, the, the, the so-called megahertz myth. Um, it starts with a, you know, something that I think makes quite a bit of sense. You know, 500 megahertz is 500 megahertz. Fair enough. But you can't just extrapolate that to any kind of architecture. You've got the differences between, uh, for example, here, uh, Intel. You can have a 500 meg megahertz Intel processor, but it's not going to work the same as a 500 megahertz ARM processor. It's just not the same. Now, I have an analogy to illustrate. I don't know if there are any slash dot readers in the audience. Do you, do you, is there any kind of... Uh, Analogy that would immediately spring to mind. <laughs> it's uh, yet another terrible car analogy. Uh, yes, I'm afraid so. So we have a car, or a nice car, S Martin DB9. It has 470 brake horsepower. That means you can get from 0 to 100 yeah, pretty quickly, four and a half seconds, just over. Top speed, yeah. I don't think I'd manage that on the, on the highways here. Pretty quick. Well, I didn't just pick this car because it's a nice car. It's uh, because there's another vehicle which has uh, yeah, basically identical uh, horsepower, but it's a little bit different. It looks like this. Um, so um, yeah, just, to, just to point it out, this, this one here, four wheels, uh, six wheels on this one. Uh, this one is yellow, the other one kind of grey. Hmm. It's not as fast. And plenty of power. Yeah, just an estimate here. I don't have the exact figures. But yeah, top speed isn't so great either. But then if we put that to one side and look at the other things, okay, the, the, these machines are designed for completely different things. Uh, you ask the modern, yeah, you can maybe fit your set of golf clubs in the back. Um, but, you know, a big truck like this, uh, you can put a big trailer on the back, you can fit plenty in. Yeah, again, I don't have the exact figures, but I'm using the uh, metric buttload uh, unit uh, of measurement here. So the same is true uh, for, for processes of different architectures. Um, yeah, where, where is the difference? Yeah, the instruction set is different, obviously. This is a complex, this is reduced. Yeah, you have more instructions. But with all those term extensions, it's rather complex. It's yeah, rather it is, yeah. But still not, uh, not anywhere near as complex as, uh, as a modern uh, Intel or, or AMD processor. Um, the number of uh, instructions, yeah, that relates directly to the number of transistors and the the power consumption and the the difference in scales of uh, how how big these transistors are it's all a big trade off and one machine will do it differently to the other um, another really big difference uh, ARM processors in the, you know, generally speaking they have less cache uh, and that means a memory bandwidth is very important so if you have low memory bandwidth it's going to be slow. Um, your modern uh, Intel's have probably got two or three layers of cache and with the ARM you're generally lucky uh, to, to have one. Um, but also just the internal structure of how these things are built, uh, how much uh, you can parallelize things and you know, stuff like uh, pipelines, it's just just a different, uh, different ball game. Um, and then you can take two seemingly similar machines uh, they both have uh, um, configurable clock speeds. You can set them both to 500 megahertz, but still, even with these machines, it's not the same kind of performance. Um, Pandora does have a distinct advantage, um, not so much with the, the power consumption versus the scale, 
they are different, but the big thing is uh, memory bandwidth, which uh, you know, is a lot higher on the Pandora. So, what can we do with these things? <coughs> Let's look at the from the bottom up. Yeah, it's probably not uh, not a huge surprise. I've got a small ARM-based uh, system. I want to play some games on it and do some other stuff. Yeah, it's kind of uh, easy choice to put Linux on it. So that's what most of these things use. On top of that, you know, any developers uh, will know these uh, pretty well. It's just sort of uh, libraries with which you can develop uh, graphical applications, OpenGL or ES in this case, uh, the mobile version of OpenGL for 3D uh, work. SEL is used a lot for, uh, yeah, for 2D. X-Windows, yeah, wasn't really such a big thing. But now that the, uh, uh, with the Pandora, you're getting a little bit more power in there that you can run X Windows. It actually runs a full desktop on top. XFC uh, is, a, is a standard one, but you know, the others have been, uh, been run on it. Um, SDL, you can also make a nice interface with it, a nice uh, graphical interface. This isn't actually, I don't think this, this is an interface from the GP2X. I don't think it actually uses SDL, but you know, this is a good, uh, illustration of what I meant. Yeah, there's a Linux kernel on there, so people have also been asking, oh, can, we, can we run Android on these things? Well, the answer is yes, but I think there's only a, a quick uh, proof of concept uh, a couple of years ago when the Pandora was sort of uh, in development. Someone had the Android running on it, but kind of fizzled out. So if, uh, if someone wants to put the hours in, yeah, you can run Android on it, although I don't, don't think they're ever going to be uh, supported platforms. Now, one of the big things that these things are used for is gaming and emulators. So we can play your old uh, retro uh, console games. Um, yeah, starting uh, near the bottom with 8-bit uh, consoles, you don't really need a lot to emulate that. In fact, these uh, uh, earlier devices actually do a better job than some of the later ones because they're much more efficiently coded uh, in that way. Um, moving into 16-bit, yeah, you probably want something like a GP2X to uh, to do that well. Yeah, it does run on the other, but yeah, it's starting to get good. The Wiz, yeah, this is coming up towards the sort of uh, power to emulate a PlayStation. There's uh, uh, a couple of uh, PlayStation emulators in the handheld uh, scene. One of them runs pretty well on the Wiz. If you want it to run really well. You need a Pandora. You just need that extra power just to uh, to get it going uh, nice and smoothly. And it's uh, yeah. There's also uh, for the Pandora at least. There's a Nintendo 64 emulator. Some work on a Dreamcast emulator. Well, it's, uh, I think the the guy doing it has moved into the um, into Android, but a lot of the code can of course be reused, and uh, hopefully we will see that back on the Pandora eventually. Oh, a nice uh, feature. One of the developers uh, made a, yeah, it's, it's not really an emulator. It's, it's actually stands for Ginge is not a GP2X emulator. It's more of a virtualization uh, concept that you can, uh, they all have uh, ARM processors underneath. So you can sort of translate a few, uh, a few hardware things and uh, emulate others. And it basically means you can run stuff from earlier GPH consoles. You can run this on that and this on that. So basically, you the, the whole software library of, uh, you know, since the, the GP2X, you can run it all on the, the uh, Wiz or, of course, uh, Kanu and on the Pandora. And if we uh, move over to more uh, serious uh, computing, you know, stuff like home computers, yeah, this is Commodore 64 down there, typical 8 bit machine. Um, Moving up to 16-bit, you know, Amigo, or ST. Yeah, you want to emulate that, and you're probably going to want something around the Wiz mark. Uh, emulators on the Pandora are very good, uh, given the higher screen uh, resolution as well. And the keyboard, which is important for a lot of things. Um, yeah, Intel PC, I think the Wiz comes in around the 286, and uh, the Pandora, low-end 486. Just, that's just a pure uh, for DOSBox emulation. So what, uh, and where do all these games come from, anyway? 
Um, and you can use it you know, in anything that will run on Linux, basically, but you, know, you have to remember it's not the most powerful machine in the world, so you're going to have to make some sacrifices and something just aren't going to work. But you know, there's uh, some clever guys working on stuff and getting pretty good results. Um, some porting required, yeah, sometimes you just need to recompile it and it'll work straight away. And generally, you need to uh, tweak the knobs a little bit, change things like uh, input methods, uh, screen resolution, uh, stuff like that. And so it can be very easy. On the other hand, it can be very, very difficult. Uh, sometimes whole things need ripping out and replacing with uh, much faster code to get them running at all. Um, yeah, one of the big things is also a homebrew uh, development. Yeah, the people are sitting there working on games. Not necessarily open source stuff, maybe they're just doing it as a, as a hobby and uh, say, well, I've made this game and uh, you know, go ahead and play it. I'm not going to give you the source. Although often uh, they'll report it to the new devices as they come out. Or if they've not got them, they'll, they'll hand on the sources to other developers so they can, so the games can live on in uh, new platforms. Um, there is also commercial games available, more for the, uh, uh, the GPH side of things, not so much for Pandora. Um, you can go to the GPH website and download uh, games that you can pay for. Uh, some of them are pretty good. So aims are more at the career market, so if you like RPGs and stuff, uh, that's, your, that's your thing. Uh, the Pandora App Store, uh, yeah, that was built up in, uh, with the idea that uh, we can sell commercial games through it as well, but as far as I know, that there aren't any yet. And a couple of examples, uh, SuperTux, a bit of a Mario-like game, GPL license, so yeah. Just get your toolchain, compile it, and that's pretty much it. Cave Story is a nice little uh, homebrew game for the, uh, the GP2X, which Ginger can play it on Pandora as well. It's a good example. I don't think it's open source, but. Is uh, the and uh, no, I think that's something else. I think that's something else. Uh, no, this is some guy just, uh, just developed this on his own. Now this is a nice, uh, you know, one of my favorites as well. We've got a uh, Scom VM, which is a, yeah, a virtual machine for the Scom engine for uh, lots of point-and-click adventure games, Monkey Island series, for example. Yeah, I don't know, stuff like Leisure Suit Larry, Sierra games. You can play them all on there, and that'll run on uh, Pandora or uh, or the Wiz, stuff like that. Quake Three, yeah. This I, I chose this example because uh, it's kind of a split. You've got uh, it's a commercial game, obviously, but uh, the, the, the engine is open source, so you can port the engine to a device, get that running, and then you just need the, the, the data files from the actual game, plug them in, and you can, you can run it. So uh, Quake 3 on the Pandora is, uh, is actually pretty playable. It's, uh, it's a nice port, and you can run it with you know, pretty much full resolution. Um, yeah, th there weren't many commercial games to choose from. This is one for the the GPH. I'm not sure what's going on there exactly. It's an RPG for the for the counter, so yeah, whatever floats your boat. Now yeah, start looking at a little bit more serious applications now. Uh, not too serious, so multimedia. Uh, you can play your music on these things. You can watch videos. There's uh, yeah, the, what you start to see here is that the the whole the the desktop environment on the can uh, on the Pandora uh, makes it much easier to port most of these applications because you've got proper Windows interfaces and you can uh, yeah you're not you're not tied down to something uh, yeah more more low level like STL you can much easily uh, much more easily port sort of full applications that rely on a window manager so that's why we see a lot more stuff up uh, up this side and player of course very popular VLC. Um, yeah, and play on this side, but yeah, then with the SEO backend, so it's all sort of a little bit scaled down. But it works pretty well. Web browsers, yeah, the counter is it's kind of limited uh, that way. So there's a couple out, and sort of uh, more text-based things. So full graphical browsers, yeah, there are several on the the Pandora. Uh, 
email pro yeah, I've had to find an email program for the the kind of it's not really meant for, it's more for gaming. Um, you can read your mail on the Pandora. Yeah, sorry. And a program to uh, do your Twitter and your uh, other social media? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I've not really uh, not seen anything about it, but I know uh, yeah, stuff like Pigeon and stuff that runs on there. And I'm sure there must be something for Twitter. I've not, uh, web not web used it. There's a web browser. Mm -hmm. uh, there be uh, two uh, special uh, programs to do your Twitter and other social media for on, on Ubuntu, but uh, are there for on the handheld too uh, that kind of programs? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, uh, to be honest, but uh, if it exists and it's open source, uh, it can always be ported uh, to it. Yeah. And yeah, as you say, you, you've got the web browser, you can do it through the normal uh, web interface, but yeah, I, I honestly don't know. But it can't be uh, more than a compile uh, away. Yeah? Um, yeah, it's probably not exactly an obvious uh, application, but you can write uh, documents, you can do your spreadsheets on there. Uh, someone had open office running on the uh, on the Pandora. I'm not sure what the current status is. Um, yeah, full on uh, graphics uh, stuff and GIMP and uh, yeah, and a couple of more uh, yeah handheld oriented uh, graphics programs. You can do that as well. Yeah, again, on the GPH side, it's a little bit more limited, but yeah, you know, again, it's not it's not really designed for for that kind of stuff. A uh, quick look at uh, development. So mm, you can use all kinds of different languages to develop on these platforms. And C++, and C++ uh, yeah, kind of the obvious uh, choice for uh, Linux systems. Um, but yeah, you can do Python. If you don't know the dist uh, uh, mechanism of Python, you know, someone made PND, and dist uh, PND so it makes, uh, packages your Python code into a nice little uh, yeah, PND package, as they're called. You can just shove that on SD card and it'll run. Uh, Pygame, yeah, it's sort of a gaming uh, API on top of Python. Uses STL underneath, I think. Um, there's more uh, high-level languages that you sort of uh, design your graphics and do a little bit less, uh, little, uh, less coding. Still get pretty good results. Benu Geo Basic, uh, good examples of that. You can do Java. It's not always uh, particularly fast on uh, these things, but there's, uh, there are JVMs at work. And of course, if you're feeling brave, you can dive into ARM assembly. And uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, very smart guys working on stuff like that and really optimizing the hell out of uh, some low level stuff. Some really fast uh, code. Um, so, what do you need? You get a tool chain for, uh, for C, for example, based on GCC. Um, Code Sorcery is a, uh, an organization, a company. They package up uh, compilers and tool chains, so you can you can go and download one and just install it, put it in your path, make files, a bit of editing, and uh, it all works. Uh, GPH has an uh, official SDK that you can download from their side. Uh, on the Pandora side, yeah, there, as far as I know, there still isn't a real official SDK, but there are several uh, community contributed SDKs that are uh, floating around. Some of them are very good. And what can we expect in the future on this, uh, in the, the handheld scene? Well, nobody knows. There's a, uh, yeah, this, this should be out by now. This uh, the, the OMAP 4. It's the successor of the OMAP 3 in the Pandora. Yeah, twice the 3D performance, so, uh, yeah. Nice for more modern games, uh, higher clock speed, dual core, so quite a bit of oomph for a little tiny uh, handheld. People are hoping that that will probably get make its way into the Pandora too. As far as I know, there's no uh, concrete plans. Are still busy shipping the first Pandora. So uh, two months, two months. Yeah. and more software. Hopefully, the more people who get hold of these things, the more developers come along. 
the more software we get and it makes the world a better place. Um, now this is one uh, you know, a bit mysterious, there's not a lot to find on it. It's been floating around the internet for a while. Yeah, it looks suspiciously like uh, Sony's new uh, handheld. But uh, it's uh, supposed to be made in China. Um, you know, they've got quite nice specs, HDMI uh, output, so you can plug it into your telly. Um, rumors are that it will run Android, but yeah, you know, the details are pretty scarce. I don't know if we'll ever see the light of day, but a nice little platform to hack on if you can uh, find one eventually. A um, couple of websites that you can uh, you can look at if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, Pandora has its, uh, its own uh, forums and a website, openpandora.org. Um, GPH has its uh, fungp.com. It's a similar idea, but you know, a bit more commercial, uh, really. And the GP2 uh, GP32X forums is sort of where you know, it's cross-platform. All these things come together. And uh, yeah, you tend to see people falling into particular groups, but yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of co cooperation going on there, which is nice. So that's uh, pretty much uh, the end. If uh, anyone have any more questions? Yeah? Do you, do you want to write from a right media site? I couldn't see it on the. Oh, okay, screen. yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll come to you afterwards. So, uh, I'll show you. I've got this uh, presentation on, uh, as a PDF. Actually, a little bit longer uh, version of this with some more about uh, development and packaging of, uh, of code into uh, uh, Pandora or GPH uh, packages. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll switch out with the URL for that afterwards. Yes? If you do change that, uh, running on, on every major platform like uh, Linux, Mac, uh, Windows? Um, uh, I'm sure it runs on Linux, that's what I use. Um, Windows, I think it is a code sorcery for Windows. Mac, I'm not sure about, but I think uh, if all else fails, you can compile your own cost compiler on there. I, I, th I think there is some pre It's just GCC? Hmm? It's just GCC that... that yeah, it's just GCC with uh, yeah, the, the ARM GCC. So as long as you get the right kind of uh, uh, targets in there, yeah. it should work. You can compile libraries and go. Compile libraries, yeah. It was, you, you, or you can download one of the SDKs that are already there, or the libraries already in it, and the headers makes it a lot easier, believe me. Yeah. And how, how do you bootstrap stuff? How do you get stuff into the Pandora? Is, is that just putting it on an SD card or...? Is yeah. Yeah, that's the, the, the part that would uh, take too long to explain here. I did it in an earlier version of this presentation. Um, basically, what you do is you put all that stuff in a, in a zip file, for example, for uh, the GPH, or you put it in a, you know, a package that's based on um, an ISO or a CRAMFS, uh, CRAMFS, something like that. One of these read-only uh, file systems, you crunch it up and it makes a package and you just put that on the SD card, you plug it in, and it pops up in the menu or on the desktop. Okay, and, and you, you can't, well, the, this, is, this is kind of cumbersome if you, if you do development, because it's each and every site where you have to like load yeah. it into your card. Are there, are there kind of uh, 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 JTAG or other means to get into direct, you, you code directly into the... Uh, JTAG there is, you'd have to open it up and solder some wires on, I think. Yeah. But there is, uh, <laughs> there is JTAG. Um, but there is, yeah, you, you can run um, you can run the debugger on it, uh, GDB uh, runs well. And uh, what I usually do is compile it and then just copy stuff over with SSH, there's SSH uh, server on there, just copy it over and then start it on there. No, it's crashed, fix it, copy it over again. Yeah, that kind of, uh, that kind of process. Or yeah, you can, you can compile on, on the Pandora itself as well, yeah, but it, it but it's, well. Uh, takes quite a bit longer and it takes a lot of lot of space. Yeah. Okay. Any more? Yeah. You are, you are now speaking about oh, sorry. Uh, developing uh, the user and stuff. Is the uh, kernel and the infrastructure also open source and are I working on that? 
or is that delivered by the manufacturer? Um, GPH do a lot of work on the kernel purely for their own uh, devices and they don't have a very good history for uh, bringing the sources out but I think that's getting better now uh, and uh, the Pandora kernel uh, changes I think some of them have even gone upstream so they uh, you get them automatically and the rest there's uh, they have their own git and everything so uh, you can download all the all the patches that you need yeah I have a question about the tool chains. Uh, once upon a time, when I still had a lot of spare time, I, uh, I bought a GP2X, one of the originals, mm -hmm. and I uh, did a cross-compiling tool chain for Fedora, actually as RPM packages. Yeah. So bootstrapping and building them nice and urban. Do you think there is some added value in doing that, so that the distribution would come with a pre-packaged tool chain chip, so a user could just yum install or app get install yeah. the tool chain? I think it would definitely help a lot. The, the, the tool chains I've used up to now, yeah, it's a case of downloading it and you have to uh, yeah, the unpack it, put it somewhere and uh, you know, change all your path and stuff. But, yeah, I think it, it would of course be a lot easier if you could just do a uh, you know, yum install or app get and you had it. But I think uh, yeah, it wouldn't be too much work to do that, I think. I don't, I don't know why no one's done it. See inside a packaging system that uses a build boot itself is tricky, but yeah. I, got, I got it done anyway for the GP2X, so the hard yeah. part is done. Yeah, well, uh, be, be my guest. Be my guest. I, I'd use it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if people are interested, I can help them getting started, but I'm mm. afraid I'm not just spare time to no. do it. Uh, tell me about it. Anyone, uh, any more questions? No, I think we're. We're at the end, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you for coming. Um, time to get to lunch, I guess.